Bagel, thank you so much for taking the time to chat to us today. It's an absolute honor having you on the show, and I've got to say congratulations on Pantheon. Thank you, Deb. So, Craig, tell us a little bit about Pantheon. Where did this original idea come from for you? I know it came from um, some short stories, but what made you decide that those short stories should find a life in this brand new series? Uh, well, it started um, out of a casual conversation uh, with AMC, uh, uh, who I was partnered with uh, for a few years doing uh, a very different type of show, a historical drama. And um, when we were coming to the end of that and looking for what's next, uh, we were looking at just a bunch of different pie in the sky type of ideas and properties. And it was a off the cuff remark from an executive at AMC who said, uh, if anything looks too expensive um, to to produce, we're also open to animation. Sort of said over the shoulder, leaving the room type of a comment, you know. And I, I just uh, I couldn't believe it. I, I was so excited. I thought um, I would never never normally want to pitch that, but animation um, came came first, and then it was uh, the idea of uh, trying to find the right kind of story to pair and tell in a, um, adult animated, uh, form, uh, is, is, uh, I was on the hunt for it. And that's when I came across the short stories by Ken Liu, which were also under option, uh, from AMC. And, uh, I thought it was the perfect, uh, blend of to start grounded and human as, uh, as is the way that Ken usually comes into his stories and scale up from there. So what was it about those short stories when you read them that made you decide, no, this is the perfect project? Because like you said, there would be so many options out there. What was it about them that just you went, no, nah, these are the right ones to pitch to AMC? Um, well, it helped that they already were interested in those short stories. Yep. Um, and they had optioned them. And that... Uh, that I really connected to the character of Maddie um, at the beginning, and the in a very short amount of time, uh, of, you know, through this triptych of short stories, uh, kind of took this to a kind of um, really exciting, almost a World War Three place, and then a, to a to a uh, interesting post-apocalyptic place, and. Um, at the same time, I had another story that I was working on, uh, and I saw an opportunity to marry the story I was working on in in with these stories, and it was sort of the missing piece uh, in a way yep. to making that one work. And that's that's if you watch the show, all the stuff with Caspian, the character of Caspian, kind of had his birth outside of the short stories of Ken's, and um, married in in a really really great way. The, the show looks at some very, very deep themes, like themes as deep as what does it mean to be human? Were you ever afraid as a writer that that would be very difficult to bring to the screen and present to the audience? Um, no, only because uh, the short stories have pointed a way uh, to always being on the human side of things when you were asking uh, those questions. Um, so it wasn't a series of TED Talks, if you will. You yep. know, it was um, people struggling with scenarios um, and what ifs and, um, you know, sort of uh, domestic drama in these high concept um, scenarios, one after the other. And that was, um, I found very, uh, very fun and um, juicy to adapt. So when you first started to sit down and, and work on the screenplays, what changed for you because you knew that this was going to be an animation? We have a lot of writers who listen to this show, so I'm sure they'd be interested to know, does that writing process change for you as the screenwriter once you know that a project is going to be animated? Um, I honestly... Uh, I honestly didn't I approached it uh, in the same way because the style that I was uh, going after was this grounded uh, inspired by the kind of grounded cinematic anime 
uh, out of, coming out of Japan. Um, and the, the length of the shots and the kind of shots that they had, the lighting, um, it felt like uh, similar to what I would have done in live action. Um, and so I took it from there. And only later, because I didn't know anything about animation when I started it, I started to realize how difficult I had made it for some of the animators. Yep. Um, and then when I took a look back at some of those uh, scenes I real and, and some of those other projects, the anime that I'd seen, I realized, oh, wow, they're really off of these characters' faces for a long time. Uh, and on this wide shot, looking at the, you know, the back of their head for a long time. And... Um, that the, I did, I broke a lot of rules without knowing that I was breaking them. And the interesting thing about that is that the animators were very excited because they, they weren't usually asked to do things like hang on a character's face for a, a good long time and try to make it seem like they're thinking of something. That's really, really easy to do in live action, really, really hard to do in animation. Yeah. What is that relationship like on an animated series between the animator and the writer? Like, do you have a very close relationship uh, or is it very similar to the kind of relationship that you would have with a director on a, a real life action? This, um, it is similar. I think this was a, a very close and, um, and thankfully really fruitful relationship with the uh, supervising director and, and executive producer um, of Pantheon, a, a guy named Juno Lee. Um, I absolutely uh, consider him to be a co-showrunner of this. Uh, it's not just that he's the you know supervising director and I'm I'm running the show. There's uh, there's there's so much that he he is in charge of and executing. Um, that, that I never see and that I couldn't I couldn't frankly do I, I the one, one way I think about it is that on a live action set I technically can do these other jobs I can direct and I have I can act maybe not great right but I can do it yep. I can't draw I yep. can't and, and 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 there are things about that art that um, I had to uh, uh, you know I, it, felt, it was awkward for me giving giving directives on um, but, uh, but he was great and, and, uh, remains great and really helps, really helped in that. What is those discussions like when you sit down to talk about what a character should look like? Like how much freedom do you give the, <laughs> the animators for that? Or is, is that something that you sit down with them and say, well, this is what I thought Maddie should look like? Yeah, that's a great question, and I was just talking about it um, a couple days ago with our character designer Jojo. Um, the uh, it was so it was surprisingly difficult for me because um, if they would present a character's face, let's say, um, I and I was make I would you know feel like oh their their chin's a little too big or their nose is a little um, too flared or. You know, I don't like that. I felt really, I almost felt like I'd be saying that to an actor in during an audition, which I would never say. Yeah. Right. Um, and it was incredibly, uh, I had to get over that, you know. Um, it was really weird to talk about someone's face and body uh, with a bunch of other people listening in. Um, and, you know, they didn't have this problem. I did. Um, and so, uh, and I also didn't know you know, you didn't know if you were insulting the, the artist as well, right. By saying uh, this, but they didn't, they didn't see it that way at all. And, um, I learned a lot about, um, the kind of drawings that are, because the art that they had to figure out is how do you draw something that hundreds of other hands are going to have to draw? You, you know, you, you can't make the drawing so, um, complicated, uh, I don't want to say skilled, but you can't make it so unique to your own hand that um, all these other finishing animators can't do the same, hope to do the same thing uh, later on. Um, so that was fascinating. Yeah. Is there an added element of excitement there as you watch that world come to life through the hands of an artist? I mean, when we work on a, a real life action series, we watch the sets come together 
and then everything is pretty much instant then like you see it act out in front of you is it is there an air of excitement for you as a showrunner and a writer when the the artwork is handed to you and you get to see it for the first time yeah absolutely um it makes every uh you know, shot, even static shots of, of props and things like that. So exciting. Um, an example that I would use is that if you were in a live action, uh, you know, scene of somebody chopping vegetables at a, in a kitchen, you'd have the wide shot, you'd have them chopping and maybe a B camera would pick up, you know, the close action of the knife going through the vegetables, right? If you wouldn't think about it yep. to do that B shot, that insert in animation, someone's got to draw it. And, we know that someone drew it when we're when we're uh, watching it, and that may, makes something that might be we might take as uh, take for granted or take as pedestrian in live action. It makes the pedestrian poetic, and it makes the mundane moving. And um, I was always excited to see uh, every aspect of, of of that come together. Now, the other amazing thing about this show is the amazing voice cast that you've been able to put together. Tell us a little bit about how. You brought that cast together. Were there people that you wanted involved with the project from the very start, or did you do a lot of auditioning? Um, it was a bit of a mix. Um, and uh, the, the first call that I made was to Rosemary DeWitt, who plays Ellen, who I had worked with um, on the first TV show she had uh, starred on uh, years and years ago, uh, back in 2007. Um, called Standoff, uh, also starring Ron Livingston, who's also in the show. They met on that show. They got married. Um, and, uh, you know, the, I hadn't worked, worked with them since. So um, I reached out to Roe first, and, um, and slowly other people started to come on. And, and I think that one of the big benefits that we had was that we were doing this casting process in the summer of 2020, when everything had just been locked down and all productions had been ceased, um, as everyone tried to figure out what was going on with COVID and, and uh, could they get back to set and what were the protocols to do so. Um, you know, Paul Dano, I think, was getting gearing up to shoot Batman and they had to shut down, right? Yeah. All these actors were suddenly on pause. So to get a call for a job that, and to say, uh, you know, you can keep acting, you can do it from the, the comfort of your own home if we send you a recording kit, was a very, uh, uh, that helped us a lot to get, uh, I, I think, um, a lot of the great cast that we did. That was actually going to be my next question. I, I interviewed a, an actor recently at Comic-Con here um, that was involved with the anime world, and he said that for the last two years he's been voicing characters sitting in his closet with a recorder because it was the best spot to get acoustics in his house. Um, what was that like trying to put together a voice cast during a pandemic? It was, um, it was, it was really, uh, really interesting. They were all over the world. Um, uh, Titmouse is the animation company and they had a system down. They pivoted very quickly uh, um, and it was great. And yeah, I got to see a lot of insides of people's closets. Um, <laughs> I got to see, you know, uh, basically we would g get on zoom and look at them, but they were connected through a much, a much better, um, uh, type of connection. Uh, and there would be a couple engineers monitoring that to make sure the sound was recorded. Right. Um, and our voice director, uh, I would be texting notes to the voice director who was also on the zoom and, she would be getting on, giving them, you know, directions in terms of changes of performance to lines. And, you know, I just sort of see uh, um, Aaron Eckhart in his, in his closet surrounded by those sound baffles, um, you know, spitting lines or, or Taylor Schilling under her comforter, her duvet, you know, <laughs> and we're all over the world doing this. And um, uh, it was very fun. It was fun for them, I think. Definitely. Well, Craig, we are almost right out of time. So just very quickly, what would you like to say to people out there before they sit down to watch this amazing series? Um, I would say that uh, the first couple episodes uh, really don't prepare you for how crazy the show gets. 
Um, it's got a bit of a, uh, a deliberate start on, you know, um, uh, and that's intentional. Um, but uh, if, if, if you may find it a little slow, don't worry. It, it picks up and up and up and kind of doesn't look back once it's uh, once it gets uh, really cracking. 